title um, to the talk, and there are two background papers for this. And I understand that there, are, there may be more papers in the background because, if I understand correctly, I don't, correct me, there was this review of economic dynamics project. Oh, part of it was uh, published in the first issue of the Sierra. And, uh, inequality throughout the world and uh, in some different countries. So uh, we all stand to benefit. And the rest of the next 90 minutes are uh, of yours. And uh, the rules the rules are yours. Okay, so interrupt me at any time and something's unclear or you know, say something that doesn't seem right. So this is this is joint work with, with Nicola Fuchschindl, who has come back to, to Frankfurt from Harvard just this summer and up here summer who is at, at Mannheim. And so this is about inequality in Germany. I mean, the paper is, but it's part of a larger project. So what I'll try to do in this talk is sort of give you context of why we did this paper, what the larger context is, and whenever I can relate the findings from Germany to other countries as well, because that's what the entire project on trying to measure inequality across countries is, is all about. Now, since I have written the Germany paper and other people have written uh, papers on other countries, I will focus quite a bit on Germany, but I will try to connect it to developments in particular to the US and other countries as, as well. So, we have, we have started on that. So, a bunch of us, including me, we are really starting, well, we really, so by, by training macro theories. So, we write our models that deviate from the representative Asian paradigm. And we write down macro models in which households differ from each other. They're heterogeneous. Some households get good shots. Some households get bad income shots. And we study the distributions coming out of these models and how these distributions evolve over time and how they respond to, to policies. <coughs> now, in the older business cycle literature, that literature was motivated by a very well-defined set of facts against which models were then compared with. Now we have all these nice models that study distributions, but what's missing so far is a set of facts that documents over time and across countries in a comparable way how, how inequality in economic variance has evolved in, in a bunch of countries that, that are of interest to us. So this entire project that this paper contributes to is meant to be for macro heterogeneous Asian models what the old Burns and Mitchell uh, literature on measuring business cycle was for the real business cycle and New Keynesian business cycle literature, namely to provide a set of stylized facts against which models that are meant to explain these facts can be compared, can be compared against. And so this is part, I mean, this project is partially it's fully published in the Review of Economic Dynamics. <coughs> just came out in 2010. And the objective of this project was to consistently document facts about how cross-sectional inequality can be compared across countries and how it has evolved over So there's going to be two focal points, how inequality looks across countries and how inequality trends have changed over time, starting from wages through income, through consumption over, over to wealth. Uh, for nine countries, the nine countries are put on, uh, on the board here. And why these nine countries? Basically, these are the countries for which good enough data on the key variables of interest were available, and these were the countries for which we could identify country teams willing to contribute to this to this to this issue. So we have so the Anglo-Saxon countries, US, UK, and Canada. We have European countries, Italy, Germany, Spain, and Sweden. And then we have two sort of very interesting countries. And you will see that the results from these two countries, Russia and Mexico, are only to a very limited extent comparable to the other countries, simply because they have a different level of development. And in the case of Russia, uh, because they went through a transition from a uh, centrally planned economy to a market, market economy. So the Russia paper is really interesting, but it's not so clear to what extent these trends can be really compared to Western European and Anglo-Saxon in those sexy countries. And I'm happy to talk more about Russia to the extent that I can, but uh, uh, mostly I'll focus on Germany. So more specifically, what I want today to, to do today, I want to document how inequality in wages, earnings, income, consumption, and wealth has evolved over time, 
how this development compares to other countries in the project. And then, if you talk about inequality in Germany in the last two, two, two decades, you obviously cannot ignore the fact that we had the most significant historical events in German history in the last 50 years, namely the German unification. So in the second part of the talk, if, if I have time, and I hope I have, I'll talk a little bit more about how inequality was shaped by this unique event of the German unification, where you have basically have two separate countries, one much poorer than the other, you put them together, what happened to inequality? Well, there's going to be some mechanical effect, having a rich and a poor country putting together, but we we'll also see that in the period of where these two countries joined each other, inequality within these areas changed quite dramatically as well. And then we can speculate about potential causality from the historical event of unification towards, towards inequality, and I'll do that at the, at the end. So roughly speaking, just because I will show you a bunch of data, so I hope that the main message is not going to get lost in these data, so I just want to summarize the main, uh, main findings. So roughly speaking, before the German unification, we have only data for West Germany. There's some data for East Germany as well, but they were made up. Even the NEPA data is completely unreliable. So before the German unification, you have a trend of constant, perhaps even slightly falling in inequality prior to the German unification. So this captures a period from the 80s up until 1990. There was no trend in inequality in Germany at all for just about all variables that we look at which is very much in contrast to what has happened in the US, where there was a substantial increase in wage and income, and maybe to a lesser extent in consumption inequality. Relative to that, in Germany, you don't see any change in inequality prior to the unification. Then, after unification, there's this big one-time increase, because you put together poorer and richer country, and then after the German unification, there was a more accentuated increase in inequality of market measures of income, so we will look at wages and earnings, labor market earnings. That will show and display somewhat of a large increase in inequality post-unification. But then once you factor in what the government does to income by providing redistributive taxes and transfers, when you look at disposable income, there was only a very modest increase in inequality. And the same is then resembled in consumption as well to the extent that there was only a modest increase in uh, disposable income inequality, the same is about true for, for consumption, for consumption as well. And uh, once I go to the East versus West, West case, what we'll see is something fairly, fairly interesting. First of all, once the East joins the West, the East is much poorer than the West. Over time, there has been some, but by far complete convergence in terms of the levels of income and wages across these two parts. But what also has happened, there was somewhat of a substantial increase in inequality within each region. And much more pronouncedly so in the East. So the East start up once it joins the West. Within the East, the level of inequality within the East is substantially below that of the West. By 2004, that's when our data finishes, the East has converged somewhat in terms of income levels, consumption levels, but it very much also has converged in terms of inequality measures as well. So the East has become less equally distributed at the same time it has caught up with the West in terms of, in terms of levels. And there's quite a few caveats that I have to mention that, that may confound this analysis. Basically, I will not have much to say about the impact of migration, which is substantial in that period, on shaping these, shaping these developments. What I'm going to do is, I'm not going to have all that much theory to offer. In fact, in fact the only theory I'm going to use is a house of budget constraint to organize, organize my data. Because the objective, eventual objective is, here's a set of models that we want to use in order to evaluate the data. So just about every model that you write down in this class of models has a house of budget constraint. Where you have financial assets, you have real assets, you have consumption, you have income, and somehow households make consumption decisions in the wake of random income or wages. And I will use that budget constraint to organize the data and then say, okay, given that my theory tells me this is the variables in the budget constraint whose evolution I should look at, that's exactly what I'm going to do in the data, starting from the primitives of what these models usually take as given towards the endogenous outcomes uh, that 
these theories usually try to explain. So I will start from the most primitive notion of wages and go from wages through labor earnings. These are the two concepts that are typically taken as given. And then these models are all about what do households do with consumption and wealth in the face of random wage or income fluctuations. So then I will go from wages and earnings through consumption and wealth and try to rationalize how these distributions uh, evolve. So, mm -hmm. is it right then in your approach to think that for your purposes, uh, say wage inequality is exogenous? You're not taking a stand on various decisions causing, you're not taking a stand on various decisions made by households causing some people to have high wages and other people to have low wages. So in this project, which is essentially purely descriptive, this is fairly, I mean, th this is just not on the table. But whenever you write down standard Ayagari beauty type models, typically either wages or more frequently even earnings are taken as exogenous. So there you take a very strong stance and say that basically those things are stochastic, but exogenous we given to the household are not shaped by household, household decisions. At least the random part. There may be a component of wages that has to do with education decisions, that may have to do with life cycle profiles. So one thing that I will do, I will take wage inequality and try to decompose it into the sort of more residual stochastic part, and then a part that is uh, driven by observables, education, age, and so forth. Now, in this paper, I have nothing to contribute about why households choose their education and why wages change over the life cycle, but at least I will be able to tell you how much of the change in inequality is driven by changes in, say, the skill premium, and how much of it is driven by residual in, uh, dispersion in wages that, that uh, seems to be stochastic. But given that this is basically describing the data, I will not have too much to say about why that comes, why that comes about. Which is, I mean, even, even if you go step back and you go to theories, I mean, if you think about your standard Bully Ayagari type model, there, I mean, the bare-bone model is a model where earnings are following a stochastic process. If you have a life cycle model, you put, you put a life cycle structure on it, <coughs> and that part is taken as exogenous, and the key of the theory is how this stochastic earnings translates into consumption and, and wealth. That's the focus of the theory. So, yeah, I guess we can probably talk about this later in more detail, but um, um, you can actually ask yourself, if you look at people that are, say, in their 60s, and for those people look at the consumption distribution, uh, one can ask, and I don't think anybody's ever done that, to what extent is that inequality or distribution explained by exogenous things, or to what extent is it explained by decisions like uh, overeating and having, as a consequence, bad health shocks, and we know that those uh, obese people have lower wages, uh, by smoking and having health shocks that eat up your uh, budget, by divorce that requires two households, two domiciles, where in your 30s you only had one. So has anybody ever be, you know, well, I mean, so that kind of a decomposition? Um, there's some empirical work by Eric Hurst and Mark Aguiar that basically, so you start from a world where you look at consumption data, you plot those over the life cycle, they display this very well-known hump of the life cycle. That's a, one of the, the main facts that come just, of, just about out of every household level data. Now, if you want to go closer to what, 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 what you suggest, you first have to disaggregate that into different categories and see how of the life cycle these profiles change by, by groups of goods. And those guys did that and they're fine for food, it's nice and hump-shaped. For durables, it's not that hump-shaped, it's basically gradually building up and then so sort of flattening out. And the tame and expenditure is, is, is the same. And those guys, what they try to argue is that what shapes consumption decision is not just expenditures, but also the time to consume. So they have a theory that tries to explain and rationalize that by saying that over the life cycle, the, the price of time changes. So goods that require both time input as well as expenditure input increase in the expenditure pattern whether it's good that are 
uh, like food, you can produce at home or at home, where they are substitute with respect to time and expenditures, they have a hump shape over of the life cycle. So that's as far as it gets. I think going after the precise question you asked, I think without a theoretical model, I find it very hard to to try to get after it. I think the name of the game there has to be construct the model, solve the model, see what the model predicts, and then see whether you can find support of that. In the data. I mean, we do know that expenditure shares on health goods increase substantially you know, as, as people become older, but that's perhaps not surprising. It does not require sophisticated, sophisticated models. So there's actually a part of the paper that I present here, which I will not talk about, that will document all of what happens over the life cycle. Here we'll be more interested in what happens in the time dimension. Uh, so it's actually not just a question of what other people have done, but it's kind of like, in my mind, why would I care right? if inequality changes for some completely exogenous reasons? Uh, there might be nothing I can do about it, right? If inequality of consumption, say, especially later on in your life, is to a large part explained by endogenous factors, and if I have reason to believe that some of those decisions are not so healthy, if I'm a good paternalist, then I can perhaps think about how I want to influence these decisions. So uh, it's one thing to, to say, well, yes, inequality has gone up or has gone down or has, has stayed constant, but it's a completely different game than just to say, yes, I'm going to use this for policy purposes. Oh, no, I mean, so in this talk, you will never hear me, and if I say that word, it's certainly my mistake, the word welfare. I mean, I will document distributions and how they have changed over time. And the objective is for the use of positive analysis of particular models, which today I will not contribute to. The step <coughs> of saying something normative about uh, whether the change in inequality is a good thing or a bad thing, that's something that I would be very hesitant, hesitant to do. Certainly when I talk about wages and, and earnings. With consumption, consumption gets closer and closer to what we think is, is welfare relevant, but to the extent that we do not know whether this evolution of inequality is due to luck or choices, uh, it's very hard to take a stand on, on the welfare implications of that, of that change in inequality. I mean, the moment I write down a particular model, I can give you exact consequences for welfare of how these distribution change. But just looking at the data, that's going to be uh, completely easy. So I'll, I'll write down the budget constraint. I briefly talk about uh, the data that I'm going to use, and then I'm going to start documenting the findings. The first set of findings will not have anything to do with inequality. I will start by documenting what has happened to mean income and mean consumption over time. And that's partially for evaluating how good the data is, because for mean income and mean consumption, we can ask how well do the microdata that you need for inequality studies actually follow the corresponding NEPA data? Because if you find that the aggregate data paint a completely different picture of economic growth than the microdata, then you may start to worry a bit about the quality either of the micro or the macro data. And you know, I, I say that now because I know that for Germany this is actually going to look pretty good. And then I'm going to give you some disturbing news about US data. You know, that doesn't look so good at all. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the inequality trends, and then I'll talk about inequality <coughs> over time for the German, for the German case, driven by the German uh, unification. So a typical, a typical uh, model in, in this literature has the following logic. Households receive labor income, where labor income is either taken as exogenous or arising from endogenous labor supply decisions by members of the households, males and females. So labor income is equal to whatever the wage of the male member of the household is, whatever the wage of the female member of the household is times their hours work. That makes up labor income. So they receive labor income. They have assets at, at the beginning of the period. Assets typically compose financial assets and real assets. In the German case, I will mainly talk about real assets, housing, because that's the majority of all assets in German household portfolio, which is also true in the US for the median household. But since the financial wealth distribution is very skewed for, for averages, in the US financial wealth is more important than for, for German wealth. So the value of real and financial assets A 
plus the income from financial assets, plus private transfers. Private transfers are gifts from people outside your family, <coughs> including requests, plus T would be uh, transfers from the government, net of taxes. So this is your income side. And you use these resources to spend on consumption, so C is consumption expenditures, and A prime, that's the value of your assets at the end of the period. So if you want to document facts relevant to this model, the gold standard for the data would be the following. These, is a mo these are models that study individual households, so you like to have household level data. This budget constraint suggests that you would like to have individual household level data on consumption, on labor income, perhaps wages and hours work, on financial and real wealth, and perhaps transfers from the government and, and private households. The main challenge of selecting countries and doing this exercise is to find appropriate data sources that has the information necessary to do this. So you need information at least to be informative about consumption, income and wealth, and you need them at least for repeated cross-section of households so that you can follow inequality over time. It would be even more ideal to have a panel, of course, where you would follow the same households over time, because then you could directly see what these households do in adjustment to receiving shocks. But if you just want to document how inequality works, you need at least repeated cross-section of consumption, assets, and income for that particular country over time, and that restricts the set of countries that entered the study. And it also sometimes requires that you not only use one data set, but multiple data sets. So for example, for the US, if you want to do this, there's a great data set on wages, earnings, and hours work. In fact, it's a panel, that's the PSID. The PSID used not to have much of useful information about consumption and even the wealth data is a bit shaky. So for, for wealth, you would go to the survey of consumer finances. For consumption, you would go to the expenditure, consumer expenditures. The same is going to be true a little bit for the German case, where we will have to use two data sets with slightly different characteristics to do all that. And the hope is that uh, despite the use of two different data sets, you can say something coherent about inequality trends for all these, all these variables. As I said, the ideal data set would be following the same households over time and measuring their consumption, income, and wealth. But that's just not available for any country apart from Italy. Italy is probably the country that gets closest. And that's why a lot of people lately in this literature have started to study Italian data, because that's a true panel for consumption, income, and wealth. And that's sort of the gold standard in this picture. For Germany, we don't have that. For the US, we don't have it either. Because, yeah. uh, so why uh, ask you about transfers, but it's actually a true, true problem question. So how do you evaluate uh, non-cash transfers, such as uh, public provision of health and education? And the second part of that question is, is education, is public education consumed? Is it part of assets? <clears throat> so to the extent that this is going to be an expenditure-based exercise, an expenditure of households, so whatever expenditure is done by household, that's going to be measured here. To the extent that expenditures are not being carried out by private households. Yeah, if I go to school. If I go to school. If it's a private, if it's a, no, then, then it would not show up in this household budget constraint because it's not something that this household's. So, I mean, I, I should have said that very clearly. C may be pretty far away from our concept of economic consumption. These are consumption expenditures on private market good that households. Mm -hmm. But see, I went to Hochschule, you went to gymnasium. Mm -hmm. And it's ha it has no, it is not reflected in this budget constraints at all. It's the not government spent more money on uh, you rather than on me. Yeah. Right? So, so it, will, it will be reflected in whatever impact it has on your taxes. And once I try to, I mean, I will document a bunch of stuff on wages. I will have something to say about how much of a premium in wages you have gotten because you have gotten to a public university. But for the private household's budget constraint, whatever is in the private household's budget constraint is going to be measured here. 
whatever is not in the private household budget constraints in terms of expenditure is not going to be measured here. That goes back to 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 the I mean, so this immediately rules out making any welfare statements about. No, no, it's, it's, not, it's not just about the, the normal uh, approach or the extent to which it's, it's, normal. It, it's about measuring and comparing inequality. <coughs> within a country, for example, across generations. So if somebody uh, got a free treatment for allergy or for uh, common cold, and somebody else at a different age got a free heart surgery, that's uh, well, not going to be measured. That's not, so, so, so my question is, and I understand what you're saying. My question is, do you believe it's a problem when, you, when you're comparing countries? Where you're comparing generational cohorts, etc. So I mean, so certainly comparing countries in terms of levels of inequality, that's going to be very hard. The hope is that as long as these uh, patterns are stable for a given country, that the trends of inequality have some informative problem. So I will not take a lot of. Whenever I show you tables about comparing different countries, the levels of inequality, I will not make a big deal. Partially because of these, these effects, partially because they come from different data sets and that may affect the level, the level of inequality. Now, with respect to, to the inter intergenerational uh, uh, factor, that particular example is partially reflected in what we do because consumption does include the payment that you do for your health insurance. So to the extent that your health insurance premium reflect maybe not your outlays, but the average outlays by your cohort, that would be part of C because it's part of expenditure. Now, if you live in a world where health insurance is run by the government and everybody pays the same fee, and that's not discriminated across households, then that would misstate the level of inequality on consumption because there's so mandated consumption insurance or redistribution uh, by, the, by, the, by the state. But when I mean, this is because it's coming from household level data, whatever is in the household budget concern, whatever is in terms of expenditures here, whatever you consume that you did not pay for is not going to be in the household's budget constraint because it's paid for somebody, somebody else. <coughs> Chile, they do have issues with inequality, and then uh, when a study tried to measure, for example, they asked the household if they receive uh, breakfast or meals in the school, then they tried to go to the institution and try to see what is the market value of that, or at least the cost of that meal, and then they tried to, you know, put that value into the income of the household. That, of course, is going to play a role when measuring inequality at the end. So how is that compared to the consumption part of measuring inequality, previous consumption only? Well, no, no. So I mean, that part, that part would be, would be here. Mm -hmm. So this would be reflected eventually in disposable income inequality. And I will show you that that's actually quite important mm -hmm. uh, to take care of. These, these transfers. Now, in the German case, these transfers are fairly benign in the sense that most transfers in Germany are cash transfers, so they can be traded basically as a source, as a source of income. And you'll see that that's quite an important source of income, particularly at the low end, low end of the distribution. But again, as long as we s make statements about a particular country and its trends over time, I feel somewhat confident. Whenever we make statements across countries on levels of inequality, because these systems of transfers are provided in a very different way across countries. You have to be careful about the level of, of inequality. As long as policies don't change too much over time, at least you would have clear visions about the time trend of inequality under stable, under stable policies. But the particular problem with transfers in Germany, I feel fairly uncomfortable with because these are cash transfers, so these can be fairly easily treated as other sources of, of, of income, and they are fairly well measured. I mean, yeah, the other argument that, that this discussion may sort of, uh, allude to is quality of the data. Is there going to be a measurement error in microdata? 
absolutely. There's going to be tons of measurement error, and whatever variables, whatever things I show you, you have to take, I mean, this is self-reported stuff. And there's validation studies suggesting how good or how bad these data are, but whenever you work with micro data, you're going to have tons, tons of measurement error, potentially. Although the validation studies for Germany suggest that the German, partially, I think we have sort of different attitudes towards filling out surveys than the Americans. These data seem to be fairly, fairly good, certainly relative to the amount of measurement error that's in the PSID or the CAs. I mean, and I mean, I just want to be upfront about that. Now, if there's a labor economist in the room, for sure that labor economist has run some regression from PSID data. If you don't believe that microdata are any good. I think you can cancel 80% of labor because that's the data that are being used for this, for this exercise. So if you're not willing to look at data that are subject to measurement error, then everything that, that we do in all kinds of fields are basically out of the And again, the hope would be that as long as measurement error does not have a particular time frame, the levels of inequality may be affected by measurement error, but not the time frame. So the minimal data requirement for doing this is, is having cross, repeated cross-sectional household level data on the variables of, of interest. That drives us to two data sources in Germany. This also drove the American group to essentially three data sources when they did the American study now I mentioned that before. So for most of the talk, I'm going to use basically the, American, uh, the German equivalent of the PSID, which is called German Socioeconomic Panel, which was actually built after the PSID, people saw the PSID and said, gee, that would be great to have for Germany, so that's what, they, that's what they did. This is a full panel. It's a panel on households that includes information about wages, earnings, hours, and income. It started, actually started in 1984, but the data were well, for the previous year, so the sample of data starts in 1983, and it goes up until at least, now it's probably a little bit further, until 2004. Has about four and four and a half thousand households, and in the spring of 1990, because Germany just became bigger by the east, a bunch of East German households were added to the survey. In fact, uh, East Germans were oversampled because there's only about 25 percent of the population was East German, and therefore you have to be careful by using sample rates for all this all this type of stuff because uh, without sample rates, this is not representative. So this is, again, it's a full panel and includes information about wages, income, earnings, labor supply, and it has some information about wealth as well. But if you want to do consumption and wealth accurately, the GSERP is not a good data set in the same way as when people do this for the yes, they would not go to the PSAD to look for consumption and wealth. They would go to the survey of consumer finances for wealth they would go to this uh, consumer expenditure survey for consumption. The same is true for Germany. For consumption and wealth, we go to uh, income and expenditure survey, which is just a repeated cross-section, meaning it has no panel co component, and it's done only every five years. So our information about uh, consumption and wealth will be only sampled every five years, so it will be necessarily much more sparse in the time series dimension as for, for wages income and earnings. So I would spend most of my talk talking about wages, income and earnings just because I have much more detailed, much more high frequency observations relative to consumption. How do these data sets handle immigration? Hmm? How do these data sets handle immigration? So in terms of migration between the East and the West? No. Or immigration into Germany. Yes, so from essentially since this one has no problem, in the sense that this is a snapshot, and it makes sure that you know, if you migrate to Germany, <coughs> Germans make sure that you are registered somewhere, so people know where you are. So you have a fairly good, accurate description of who lives in Germany. So then it's just a matter of the statistician getting the distribution right, and if they don't get it quite right, then they use sample weights to correct for that. So for this one, since it's just a repeated cross-section, that's not a problem. For the PSID, oh, sorry, in GSERP, this might be a problem because this was representative when it was started in 1983, but to the extent that the population composition changes over time, because we know, for example, that immigrants have much more kids than, than 
ethnically German, uh, native German uh, households, the way to control for that is to <coughs> sample. So because they follow the same households over time, if you don't adjust for the changing household composition in the population by using sample weights, you would have a more and more distorted view of the overall population. So the, the short answer is changing sample weights when we calculate when, when we calculate averages and, and, and because the sample itself is trying to be kept stable because it, 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 for, for the time. Okay. Now here comes some. So I'm not going to take all the data for most of my statistics, but a selected subset of households, and that is mainly driven by the overall <coughs> data project uh, applying to all online countries. So some of these choices may look awkward, and they are partially chosen by asking what's the objective of the entire exercise, and partially is chosen so that all the countries that we have can deliver data of reasonable, reasonable quality. The first choice is we're only going to look at households that are of working age. The reason for that is that these type of Julia Ayagari heterogeneous aging type models, they focus on labor income risk or wage risk. So we want to look at households that are subject to these, these risks. So that uh, implies that we throw everybody out, uh, all households out, whose head is not between 25 and 60. Definition of a head is that if there's a male worker in the household, that household is the head. If there's no male worker, then, but there's a female worker, then that person is the head. If there's nobody working, then it's the oldest, oldest adult being, being the head. And so that's, that's our definition of, of head. And we throw everybody out that's too young. Or too young. When you work with wages and hours, given that there's substantial measurement error, we take everybody out whose wages and clause below. What is implausibly low? We measure their household's wages. If it's below half the minimum wage in Germany, we think that that's measurement error, that's misreporting, and we take that household out for, for these for this exercises. The same is true if a household has negative or zero post-government earning, meaning this is a household that reports having no income whatsoever, including from the labor market, including from government transfers, including from unemployment insurance. We think that that's implausible. You're saying the net income is possible, hmm? including average income? I guess it probably doesn't matter for German, but a lot of Americans I share, the income is pretty common. It's not in any sense. From entrepreneurship? Yeah, or the stock market, yeah. or whatever it was. It probably doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, I mean, it, it, it is something that, so we, we did look, and this shops off a bunch of households. This shops off very few households. The income truncation essentially did not affect did not affect anyone. And most of what I'm going to do is first looking at wages and earnings. And for that, the asset stuff is not going to be relevant relevant either. Uh, to the extent that uh, earnings and income, which includes asset income in terms of inequality, looks very very similar. My suspicion that that's not a big issue, but that's a we should probably document how many people get shot off because of a negative asset problem. It's true that once I show you asset data, most Germans, the only asset that they have is their, their, the value of their house. And that tends to be, I mean, the income from that, the, the asset income from that is positive for at most zero. When we look at hours, we also exclude households that are not working. And then we use sample weights just to make sure that things are representative. And I'll, I'll start with raw data, but then at some point I will try to translate raw data into household equivalent per capita values. And that does make a difference for some variables, but not, not for others, but I will tell you explicitly whenever, whenever I do that. How does the distribution of household size change over time? Get smaller. Household size, size that's smaller. Right? Yeah, but how does the distribution change? I know that. The only thing I don't know is how much and how does the distribution okay. of household size change? This guy, variance of log of effective household size goes up quite, quite, quite a bit. 
Now, I will explain to you exactly what S is. S is effective household size as computed by the OECD equivalence scale. So to the extent that that's a good effective measure of household size, the dispersion of that measured by the variance of lots, that has gone up quite a, quite a bit. Actually, in the East, differentially so than in the West. In the West, it's actually fairly, I mean, the East saw much more substantial changes in household composition than the West saw after, after unification. <coughs> okay. So I will document these types of facts. I will start first with means, just to give you a sense of economic growth and to what extent the microdata resemble the macro data, and then talk about inequality. First, wages, hours, and earnings, the stuff that's typically taken as exhaustionist by standard complete markets models. Then I will go from earnings to disposable income in order to document how important government redistribution and transfers are in shaping inequality trends. And then finally, from disposable income towards consumption and wealth as the more endogenous variables in our, in our theories. And then, as I said, I'll talk briefly about the German unification. Could I ask you a general question about the strategy of the role, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly? So there was this impact, unique impact of German reunification. And there was something else going on. Right? So uh, something, some general trend is going on. Mm -hmm. So you're observing the net result. Yeah. Right? So how can you separate out the say, impact of globalization, for example? Uh, absolutely. In, in the following sense. So what I will do, I will document first in a call to trans overall Germany. The best I will do is I will decompose that trend in overall inequality into a trend of inequality in East Germany, in West Germany, and the in-between. I will have nothing causal to say whatsoever about that. So some of the trends of inequality within the East, within the West, could have been driven completely by sources that have nothing to do with the German unification whatsoever. This is just a statistical decomposition to document that inequality in the East basically has caught up the web of the West. I will have very little to say about the mechanisms by which, by which, that, by which that happens. And, but, and therefore, not just the mechanism, you wouldn't be able to say uh, what is the other component if you, if you took inequality out. If you took reunification, you can't factor absolutely, absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, and so I, mean, I will show you something that's fairly suggestive, and I sort of believe that's true. Namely, that well, let, let me show you the first picture because there seems to be a very strong connection between not only what happened to inequality and unification, but also with respect to trend growth. And you know, it's very easy to then fall into the trap and say that the two are causally related to each other. But I've no, I mean, without a model, I just don't know how to, how to make such a statement. I mean, in, in some sense, the objective of these projects is exactly that. Documenting a bunch of standard facts and then writing down coherent theories to say, let me be specific about the mechanism and see whether these types of mechanisms can explain the facts that we do, that we do observe. Okay, so what I have here is from 19, I guess, this starts from 19, uh, 1983 to 2004, 2005. I have per capita income from three sources. The black line, that's NEPA per capita income as in income measured as disposable, disposable income. So this, this line, the black line, that's per capita income just from the standard aggregate statistics. And what you observe is fairly healthy growth somewhere in the order of 2.2% per annum in growth in per capita income. Drop down, this is the German unification in the data that happened between 1990 and 1991. The East German part was significantly poorer, so you get a drop down in average, average incomes just through a composition effect of having a bunch of poorer people entering. And then after that, and this is, this is not household level, this is aggregate data, slower growth from that point, from that point on. So the growth rate in unified Germany after German unification is about only 1.1% in per capita terms. Prior to the German unification in West Germany, it was about two and, two, and, 2 and something, which is something that 
I mean, I will not have too much to say about that in terms of theory, but that's puzzling. If you think about standard neoclassical growth theory, you have a poorer economy that should make everything grow fast. What we did observe is a slowdown in trend growth that actually persisted quite up until just about before the financial crisis hit. The years 2005 and 2006 looked a little bit more promising, and then you know, the mess happened, but not anything going on the toilet. But uh, basically, three observations. Stronger growth prior to unification and after unification, and the decomposition effect uh, in the middle. So this is aggregate data. So you would think that if these house of level data are any useful, you should think that if you take your house of level data, sum them all up, divide them by the number of households, given that this, that this is a representative survey, this should look like the aggregate data. And for this exercise, we don't throw out the old guys and the young guys, we take everything. Okay, so for the inequality stuff, we're going to take out the very old and the very young, but for this one, everybody's in. So this should look like this plot. This is this German social economic panel. This is the data set for which I will, which I will use for consumption wealth, which only happens every five, five years. So there's no information in between the dots. So let's not focus too much on that. Isn't the government sector producing income? Isn't the government sector producing income? Well, this is disposable, disposable income right. by private households. So the income definition, they have small differences in the income definition between disposable income from the GSEP and the national income product accounts, but it should be just about the same. First thing I want, to, want you to, 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 to see is that in terms of trends, the micro data look exactly like the macro data. Strong growth prior to unification, drop after unification, slower growth since. Now, there is a difference in income levels, and that's substantial. And given that it's the same, Definition of income, that's a bit so disconforming, but this can be accounted for by the fact that with respect to taxes, the GSET, the microdata, doesn't do a perfect job. They basically impute taxes following the German tax law, which means that they basically only give you the standard deduction. So taxes are pretty strongly overstated in the microdata set relative to the, the macro. So that accounts for a lot of the difference in the level of, of income. But the trends are pretty, pretty heads on in the two dates, which you would hope that that, that, that did again. And the same is true. The same is true for wages. I mean, this is average wages from national income and foreign account. This is average wages from the micro data for all households, for males, for females. You see that there's a substantial wage gap between males and females. And I'll talk about that in a, in a second. How about How about consumption? Same story here from 1980, from 1978 actually, to 2004. The black line, that's NEPA consumption of non-durables plus durables, just non-durables. This is the corresponding with the dashed red line, the corresponding microdata. Now, consumption data is not available from the GSOC. That's from this income and, and uh, consumer expenditure survey. So that only happens at the uh, five years, so you cannot compare the high frequency fluctuations between micro and macro because it only happens every five years, so you only have six, six dots over here. And essentially, after unification, they match up fairly well. Prior to the unification, there's somewhat slower growth in the micro data relative to the macro data, and that's not so straightforward to account for because the consumption component should, should look fairly fairly similar. It is the case that both in the micro and the macro data, there is substantial growth in per, per capita consumption, but the growth in the micro data somewhat understates the macro macro data. Now, again, whatever this happened here, you don't see the data because you only have data in 1988 and 19, um, 19, 19, 19. So overall, this is not perfect for consumption, but the basic growth trends in the micro and in the macro data uh, show, up, show up in both, both, both data sets. Now, and again, you would say that this is the minimum 
that you should expect from a microdata. If it's representative of the population, you sum them up, you take averages, this should look like the market data. Looks very good for income, apart from the level effect that comes from taxes. Looks reasonably good for, for consumption. Now, I'm not saying that because the means look okay, there's no problem looking at inequality trends. Or the other way around, even if the means would suck, that wouldn't mean that the inequality statistics would be meaningful. But at least it's reassuring that at least the first moments of the microdata look somewhat like the macro data. And by the way, it's not clear that the macro data are perfect, perfect either. So, I mean, people always take NEPA as, as data that are not measured without any error. Uh, that's not so clear. That's not so clear either. But let me just take a quick swipe at, at the US. Because for the US, that's not the case at all. So, this is US data for per capita income, NEPA, per capita disposable income. Per capita disposable income from the consumer expenditure survey. Again, there's a gap in levels. So this is not from my paper. This is from the U.S. paper in that volume, which is done by Heathcote, uh, Perry, and Violante. So I just told them, asked them to give me their plot. So what you observe is that in terms of income per capita, exactly the same trends between micro, between macro and micro data. There's a difference in levels, and that again can be typically accounted for by underreporting and perhaps taxes. How about consumption? Now this is just food consumption. Food consumption from the NEPA, exactly the same measure of food consumption from the CX, the PSAD also has food consumption. From NEPA you observe somewhat of a growth in food consumption. In the micro data of anything, consumption goes down. And in fact, this is not specific to food at all. So let me show you This is total non-durable consumption. This is NEPA. Healthy consumption growth in the US for the last 25 years. You go to the corresponding micro consumption data from the CX, measure the same consumption data, non-durable consumption, deflate them by the same price deflator. There's no consumption per capita growth whatsoever in the consumer expenditure survey over the same period. Now, the CX is used to get expenditure shares for the CPR. So I'm just saying that that data set in terms of first moments with respect to consumption doesn't look at all like the aggregate statistics. Now, again, that doesn't mean that expenditure shares are wrong and we should forget about how the CPI is measured, but it does say that if you don't like the accuracy of the German data, they look quite good, at least in the first moment, relative to what we, what we know is the case in the US. Which, by the way, this is not a shocking new finding. People that work with microconsumption data know that for a while. And the BLS that makes up the CX knows that as well. And they're very concerned about the fact that a less and less share of NEPA consumption is gotten by the micro, by the micro data. So what's the source of price? That there's no smoking gun in that. If they would know, they 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 correct. There are several candidates. So one candidate that makes a lot of sense is that in all these micro data sets, realistically, I mean, these are long questionnaires that get sent to people. The top 1% of the income or wealth distribution, you just do not get in these, in these questionnaires. So whenever, you, whenever I say this is representative, it's representative of the bottom 99, maybe 99.5% of the US or the German population. The richest of the rich, you will not sample with micro household level data just because. I mean, apart from the survey of consumer finance for wealth, which really tries hard to get a sample the rich, you don't get them. So one explanation would be you miss the super rich, and if they account for an increasing share of consumption, given that NEPA has them, and that the CX does not, that accounts for it. Now that sounds plausible, but then this is very hard to rationalize doesn't seem to be at all a problem for, for income. Because income follows exactly the same trend. So if you if it's a big problem to miss the super rich, that should show up and should show up in income as well as in consumption, it doesn't seem to be the case. Then there's the argument about changes in the frequency of purchases, 
and, and all kinds of things. There's no smoking gun as far as I know. There's a bunch of papers being written on that that tried out a bunch of explanations and you can account for a little bit of that, but it's essentially still still a puzzle and it's, it's one that is quite, quite worse. It's not so bad for housing, consumption of housing services, but for non renewables it goes through fairly fine categories. You start with food, you look at finer categories for which NEPA is data, for which the CX is data, it shows up in just about all categories. No growth in the CX, substantial growth in the NEPA. You said because um, the rich particularly has a great incentive to understate the income, but not consumption because of tax purposes. It would, it would have to go the other way around. I mean, income is fine. So somehow, if, if, if it were the super rich, some of the super rich have to increasingly not tell about their consumption. And these are the same consumption goods, you would say, well, over time we know that consumption shares have changed between durables and non-durables, but this is the same measure of consumption from NEPA and CEX, um, deflated by the same price deflator, so that can, cannot be either. So I mean, so the short answer is, I think, there would be a well appreciated paper written, certainly well appreciated by the BLS trying to figure out what's going on. And quite a few people have tried. Among, you know, among them are Ratio Atanasio, so people that really have studied consumption over their entire life, and there's no smoking gun as of, as of, as of now. That problem, by the way, if you go to the most recent version of the CX, it seems to, they seem to have improved somewhat. But, I mean, this is really substantial. The CX used to get about 65 to 70 percent of NEPA consumption right, here they're down to 55 percent. So this is a real substantial drop in coverage in the, in the CX. Does that happen in all countries? The answer is no. In the sense that this is for all countries, the degree to which micro data and macro data line up, with respect to levels, most countries are off for income and also consumption. With respect to growth, Trends, income, every country in the sample gets the microdata resemble the microdata in terms of per capita income trends. For consumption, most countries do a fairly good job. Both the UK and the US data seems to have this problem that less and less of NEPA consumption is reflected in the, in the microdata. So it's not unique to the US. The, the UK Family Expenditure Survey seems to have the same has, seems to have the same problem. So this is just this is just first moments. So now let me turn to what we really want to focus on, namely trends of inequality. This was just to show a to give you a background against which inequality trends should be judged. The background was fairly substantially healthy growth prior to unification, the drop because of composition, and then slower growth from that, from that period, from that period. By the way, this, this growth prior to unification was fairly healthy, but it was very disappointing for Germans, because Germans, judging from the after-war period, were, were used to fairly healthy growth rates. So in fact, there were books written on why the fading German miracle has occurred, fading meaning that growth rate had slowed down, after fantastic growth rates in the 60s. Now, looking at that plot, the 80s didn't look so bad after all, uh, relative to the anemic growth experience that happened after unification. Again, you're very tempted to uh, attribute this to policies dealing with the impact of the unification, but certainly I'm in no position uh, here to argue that. So let's look at inequality. So I'm going to do uh, a bunch of inequality measures. Essentially, in terms of how I measure inequality, <laughs> measuring how a distribution changes is, is a fairly complex exercise because you know, distribution is a high dimensional object. So I will look for summary statistics that summarize what's going on with these distributions. There's going to be two statistics that summarize the entire distribution, the variance of logs and the Gini coefficient, both of which are frequently used to measure inequality, and then two measures that measures different components of inequality, the 90-50 ratio, that measures how inequality has changed at the top of the distribution, the 50-10 ratio measures what has happened to inequality at the bottom of the, of the distribution. And very roughly speaking, whatever you get from this statistic 
is reflected in the variance of the logs because because of the logs weighing heavily observations at the lower end, variance of logs focuses a bit more on the low end of the distribution, whereas the genie focuses a bit more on the high end of the distribution. So trends in this and in this will be very similar, and trends in this and in this will be very similar. And most of the statistics look very similar across all four statistics. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. In terms of on what variables are, am I going to measure uh, inequality? I will start with the raw data. I mean, after, after I've done sample selection and so forth. Now, then I'm going to move to a variable that may look a bit awkward, but that makes a lot of sense when you come from modeling. Most of our models assume that households are composed of an equal number of, of its members. Trying to reflect that in our data work, translating the complex world of changing household family size into a world where there's a household that doesn't change size, we're also going to look at how inequality uh, change if you, instead of measuring it on the raw data, you measure it in per capita terms, effectively per capita terms. Now, going from here to here is not going to matter all that much. And then, thirdly, and that goes a little bit into the direction of trying to interpret things a bit more. We are interested in how inequality has changed relative to what we can observe and relative to what we cannot observe. So, in the third step, we're going to take this variable and we're going to regress it on everything that we see about the house. In particular, we're going to regress it on a bunch of dummies reflecting family composition, on statistics that reflect age of the household, okay? dummies that have to do with education, dummies that have to do whether you live in the east or the west, dummies with uh, the, the sex of the household head, and we're going to look at inequality of the residual from that regression. What's the objective here? It's trying to get a handle on how much has inequality changed because characteristics of population has changed and how much of inequality is due to the fact that whatever we cannot explain by observables, that distribution having, having changed. And we, call, we would call that residual inequality. So whatever we cannot control for by observables, we call residual inequality. And I will show you what part of inequality in the change are, are captured by changes in household composition, in the age distribution, and so forth, and how much is left over once you control for all of these, how much of it is residual inequality. And the, the upshot of that's always going to be a lot of inequality is, is unexplained by observables. A bit is, but not all that, not all that much. So again, the upshot is going to be roughly between these measures. This and this are going to look fairly similar. And the time trends between this, this, and that, the residual of this, are going to look very similar as well. Because the residual is going to account for most of the inequality and its trends all the time. The observables, uh, I mean, they matter, but not, not all that much. Really. OK, so. With respect to wages, this is how wage inequality has, has, has evolved over time. Roughly speaking, roughly speaking, in the period prior to the unification, flat according to all measures. After unification, now the eastern has come in, there's a composition effect, and inequality goes up. Because again, you merge two sets of, of households. But not only that, once the eastern is in, inequality remains fairly stable for a while, but then Starting from the mid-90s, inequality starts to increase in wages somewhat substantially. Now, in the US, the same thing happened, the increase in wage inequality, but about 20 years earlier. The big increase in wage inequality in the US started somewhere in the mid-70s. Whereas, you look at Germany, and apart from this composition effect coming from the German unification, you look at the distribution of wages, that's essentially, that's essentially unchanged apart from the thing that comes from the German unification. And then at some point in the mid-90s, wage inequality starts to increase. And if you look at the different statistics, again, these, this statistic and this statistic measure more what's going on at the bottom of the distribution. These two statistics measure more what's going on at the top of the distribution. The increase in inequality in wages is mainly driven by increase in inequality at the bottom of the wage distribution 
relative to what's happening at the time. And again, that's significantly different from experience, experience in the US. So I guess if you come back to, to uh, immigration, my guess would be, uh, my guess would be immigration from the east kicked in a few years after 1990. But this is, this is, okay, I should have made that very clear. This is West, this is overall, this is Germany. Yeah, yeah, Germany. yeah, but immigration from, not, not oh, immigration, immigration from Eastern Europe. From Eastern Europe, yeah. Uh, that immigration, my guess, would be kicked in not immediately in 1990, but 93, 94, 95. Mm -hmm. And if you have a sizable immigration from outside of from Eastern Europe uh, with low skilled uh, uh, labor, that's what you're going to see. Absolutely. So I mean, this is and a parallel to the to the uh, rising wage inequality in the U.S. may or may not be appropriate. In terms of the driving forces, yeah, no, absolutely. That I, I completely agree. Although even for the U.S., we would argue that the same issue may be true to the extent that if legal and illegal immigration had a time trend as well, I mean, obviously you can't compare those mm -hmm. to the Eastern Europeans uh, converging to Germany, but the same the same set of stuff could have happened could have happened as well. I mean, at this point, this is just the raw data. I have not said anything about what this could be due to. And so let me let me tell you what this potentially could be due to. So let's look at some observable components that could have driven wage, wage inequality. Probably the most popular one in the US, which accounts for a big chunk of the increase in wage inequality over the last 20 years, is the college premium, which I call in Germany university premium, because so that's, that's a sharper notion. And what you observe here, the university, the College premium has no time trend whatsoever. Certainly not when the time trend in college premium in the US happened, and even afterwards. afterwards. <coughs> and by the way, uh, let me see. Let me show you just a summary. Let me just show you a summary table just, just for that. If you look at the change in the college premium across all these countries, you have the well-known fact for the S that the college premium has increased quite a bit. This is by no means a general phenomenon across the countries that we observe. It is true for Mexico, it is true for Canada, but for all the European countries, you don't see that at all. Which is, in some sense, I mean, if I take mine or perhaps our most favorite explanation for what is behind the big increase in the skill premium, skill bias technological change. It's sort of hard to see why that should not be a worldwide phenomenon given that so the change in technology should have been observed in, in, in all countries. So in that sense, I mean, I wouldn't say it's, it's a puzzle, but it's something that I would have expected example, to occur in all countries to the extent that skill bias technological change was a big factor. Now, this is of course assuming that wages are set in somewhat competitive markets. If, like in Germany, wages are artificial, they are compressed by you know, union bargaining and the like, perhaps you don't expect that, but the technological forces increasing the skill premium should be, should be applicable to all countries in the, in the sample, and that's absolutely not what you see at all. But the other explanation, other than still bias, technology changes to Asia, is the implementation of technology. Sure. So I've looked at that and showed that there's differentials between European and US. And well, but I, I would argue that, that that's true. But, I mean, my reading is that there was a time lag, significant time lag, but eventually it happened in Europe as well. Perhaps not quite to the same degree, but, I mean, I think the key features are time. And you don't see it, I mean, in, in the US, this, this happened, this happened so from the late 1970s, to the extent that even if you assume a time lag of maybe 10, 15 years, if eventually that technology was adopted in Europe as well, that's why we literally at some point you would like, you would think that this shows up, and we don't see any of that, any of that here, uh, here at all. And this is this is against the backdrop, the puzzling backdrop that 
the supply of college people in the U.S. has increased substantially. In Germany, if any, anything, this has remained fairly stable. So that makes it even more interesting that there's no trend in the college premium uh, relative to. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the questions in this regard. First of all, uh, what can you tell about the trend in college enrollment in university enrollment? Number two, what happened? What was the impact of all the university graduates from East Germany that would come to the United States? What, what impact they could have had on, on this uh, trend in, in college premium? Right? Yeah, so number three, brain drain within your opinion. Your opinion. So, I mean, the, fir the first two ones I feel I'm pretty safe from. There was a slight increase in uh, university enrollment, but that was not massive. And it was, I mean, for, first of all, university enrollment is much lower than college enrollment in the U.S., so there, there's certainly a very big difference in the levels, which uh, is partly due to the fact that what we call university, or what, what, a lot of degrees that you get here in college, in Germany you would get in schools that we would call universities, and that partly accounts for the difference. But there was no strong, no massive increase in enrollment in that particular period of the sample in university. And enrollments between East and West Germany were not that different from each other. So it's not the case that East Germany was massively more university educated than West Germany. No, no, but, but uh, let's say that all these, uh, or a large number of East German university graduates just became unemployed after reunification. That would have a big impact. Well, on the skill premium, that's true. Right. That's true. But to, I mean, so. I think there's essentially, I mean, if you were a graduate with a technical degree, your chances were not only not that bad. In fact, these guys were exactly the ones. The first thing that they did, they migrated to the West for very good wages. So there was certainly so far migration from the East to the West, but since after the unification, this is the unified German sample. That's fine. Now, in the social sciences, I'm sure that there was plenty of people that were trained in economics or what was thought to be economics in the East at that time, who still became not so valuable, and that could have depressed, could have depressed the skill premium at that point. Uh, how significant that is? I don't think the numbers are all that large. And certainly prior to this happening, we don't have an increase in the skill premium. Skill premium. Yield. So again, and it's not something that is an outlier within these nine countries in Germany. It seems that overall in Europe, where you have this big increase in the skill premium in the US and in Canada and in the UK, in continental Europe, you don't seem to observe that. Uh, the gender premium falls like in all countries. The experience premium rises somewhat like in all countries. And the big upshot is that if you look at the raw inequality in wages and the residual inequality looks just about exactly the same in terms of magnitude, of course, this is less than unequal because we took out some covariates. But uh, roughly speaking, 70% of the variation in the data remain after controlling for everything that we see. And the time trend between residual and raw looks exactly the same. You're, you're obviously you're the east. Hmm? You have a flag in the east. For, for this one, yes. Yeah. For this one, yes. So let me, let me actually show you. Do I have it for wages? I guess. Okay. We have something on hours as well, but maybe that's not so interesting. So let me jump to earnings right away. So these were wages. Now let's factor in what happens with labor supply and jump to household, household, household earnings. Upshot. So what I have here is log variance of household earnings for three, for, for three measures. The raw data, the equivalized by household size, and again, the equivalization is done by the OCD equivalent scale, which means that if you have a household, the first member of the household counts one, the second adult member and all other adult members count 0.7, all kids count 0.5. That's the OCD's way of translating family size into something that looks like equivalence. There's some drawbacks with respect to that, but if you want to do it across countries, maybe in Pompe, that's the best we, we could come up with. Having kids myself is probably understating for kids, but uh, uh, upshot, raw and equivalent makes no difference. Makes no difference whatsoever. Now, why is that? 
may become important later on. You can decompose the variance of log of the equivalent one to the variance of the raw, plus the variance of household equivalent size minus two times the covariance between household equivalent size and and, and, and and earnings. And this term roughly wipes out this term. For other variables, that's not quite true, but for this variable, that's that's how it works, works out. So it makes not much of a difference. And what I just what I just told Brian, uh, this is the residual, exactly the same time trend. The time trend being flat prior to unification, flat for a while, and then accelerating inequality starting somewhere around 1998 for all three measures. And you take out somewhat of variance by controlling for observables. But the observables, I mean, the gap, the observables take out about 25 to 30 percent of the overall variance. So residual is still 70 percent of all the dispersion in the, in the data. What do you take out in terms of observables for earnings? The key observable that comes in and explains is education. That's, that's the blue line. So that's the, this, that, that part of this version that explains, is explained by the education dummy. Perhaps not surprising that that's important because if you have a university degree, your earnings are higher relative to, relative to not having it. That's just a reflection of the, uh, of the, of the, the skill premium. And starting from 1991, we have an East dummy. And the East dummy comes in significant, but it doesn't explain that much of uh, uh, that much of a part of the bank. So, of course, prior to 1991, the East dummy is zero because we're not this in the, in the data set. So, upshot of this, whatever you saw for wages in terms of trends and inequality exactly is reflected in terms of earnings. Flat here, somewhat of an increase around unification and then accelerating inequality uh, in the light, later, part of, later part of the center. In fact, the increase in inequality for earnings is larger than the increase in the inequality of wages, somewhat significantly. So. Where does that come from? Mainly comes from the increase in the covariance between hours worked and wages. So it seems to be the case that over time, those that have higher wages increasingly work more, and those that have lower wages increasingly work less, and that makes earnings inequality rise faster than wage inequality. That covariance was negative in the early part of the sample and has become close to zero uh, in the later part of the sample. It was negative, meaning those guys that had higher wages, on average, used to work less hours, but now that's not true. That's not true anymore. And that seems to be a trend for a lot of other countries as well, that those that are highly productive these days seem to work more hours relative to what happened 20, 20 years ago. Do you interact the education with the East in this analysis? Do you not do interact with that? No, no, it is. It's, I mean, you know, it's picked up in education at the same time. It seems that once you have the East, you want to change it something a little bit. Yeah, that's, that, that's true. That, that's, I mean, that's a good suggestion in the sense that. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but it seems to be like you know, how you weight it, how the person's education is you know, weighted it for example. Yeah. True. I mean, that would be interesting too, because it's true that, uh, I mean, certainly it is the case that when the East came in, the labor force composition of the East was quite substantially different from that of the West in terms of its skill set, also the male-female uh, composition in the East, which should be uh, should be uh, picked up by the sex dummy. It was the case that in the East, the East females were much more, and much more frequent, so participation was higher, and even conditional participation, East German females worked much more, worked much more as well. In fact, these were, if you look at migration pattern, these were the first ones to leave. First, the smart females, then the smart males, and lots of the old, the not so smart, the old, comma, and the not so smart remained in East Germany. The migration was substantial. It was like one and a half million uh, for a population of 14, 14 million, excluding Berlin. So it was pretty massive. And this is just again showing where that increase in inequality happened in the distribution. Roughly speaking, 
The big increase in earnings inequality that happened after unification does not happen at the top end of the distribution. It happens at the bottom end of the earnings distribution. So this big fanning out in the later part of the sample is basically concentrated among the poor. Which also is going to be important. The next thing I'm going to show you is what the government transfer and tax program, how, how that impacted the shape of inequality. The fact that a lot of the increase in inequality was concentrated at the lower end of the distribution actually tells you what type of government programs may be most effective in changing those inequality trends from earnings towards disposable, disposable income. Because you would think that if most of the increase in inequality happened at the top, progressive taxes would be something that could, could bring disposable income closer to each other. If it happens mainly at the bottom, you may think that transfers are perhaps more important than uh, shielding disposable income inequality from earnings, from earnings inequality. Because I you know what data's going to say, so that's why I say that. that that's exactly what's going to show up uh, in, in a second. Is there actually a group of people at the bottom end of the distribution where either wages or earnings have fallen in absolute terms? I mean, if, if you define a group very, very narrowly, I'm sure there is. I'm sure you can always find one worker where it's but, true, uh, if you... But so, what, what we did... particular know, industries or particular skill classifications... No, wages, wages is not... I mean, so earnings, <coughs> for sure, because there was... I mean, so, so take the East. In the East, there were entire regions that had jobs, and these jobs all disappeared. Now, the jobs that remained, one policy response to the German unification was that basically, from very early on, it was agreed upon that wages in the East should not be all that different than, than in the West, which was, from in terms of employment, was a complete disaster because it killed entire industries. So in terms of wages, you don't see that. Why? Because there was a political decision being made that wages ought not to, not to, not to fall. In terms of earnings, you very much see that, I mean, if you were to pick particular regions, it's exactly those regions that had highly chemical industries in the East that saw earnings fall tremendously because basically all these, all these firms collapsed because wages were too high relative to productivity. So that's where you, where you see wages. Very hard, not because productivity didn't change, but because it was a political decision, decision not, to make that, not to make that happen. Which a lot of people have blamed for the, the effective deindustrialization of a large part of East Germany Basically, politically, wages were imposed that were way too high relative to, to levels of productivity so that you know, these, these industries completely disappeared. And that, was, that in turn was done in order to stop the massive migration of particularly fairly highly skilled people from the east, east to the west. Let me give you a snapshot of what otherwise I would say in great, great detail. So basically, these are measures, wages and earnings. These are measures that in the models that we want to study are mainly exogenous sources of households and then households respond to them by savings and consumption decisions. Now, before going to consumption and wealth, let me show you what the government does or what the government's impact is with respect to inequality. And let me do this. Let me do this quickly. Let me just show you one plot. This plot has four subplots. This is basically earnings inequality, including private transfers, which really does do not matter. That's the pink. That's the pink one. That's basically what you saw so far. Fairly constant inequality, slightly increasing and then increasing much further towards the end of the sun. The red line. This is disposable income inequality. And what you still observe from this plot is you barely see an increase in inequality at all. Right? Once you measure it in the data, there's a very tiny increase in inequality. So this goes up by 40 basis points. This is variance of logs, so this has a unit interpretation. So there's quite substantial increase in earnings and market income inequality. Once you go to disposable income inequality, there's almost no time trend, a very small increase in that measure. What's in between the two? Government taxes and transfers. What is it that 
basically makes the trend in market income inequality not translate into the trend in disposable income inequality. Could be transfers or taxes. Turns out that this is market income net of taxes. So the difference between these two lines, that's the impact of taxes. The difference between this line and the blue line, that's the impact of transfers. So upshot, the government tax and transfer system was massively successful in keeping disposable income inequality in check, despite the fact that market inequality changed quite substantially. And the key government policies responsible for that was the transfer system, not so much the progressivity of the tax system. And again, why is that not so implausible? Because inequality in this guy increased mainly because stuff happened at the bottom, and that's where transfers are quite effective, unemployment, social insurance, transfers. That's exactly where they kick in. And given the time, let me summarize consumption in, in a nutshell. Whatever you see with disposable income translates almost one to one into consumption. So, in a nutshell, the tale of Germany is prior to the German unification, studying inequality was boring like, like hell, nothing happened. After the unification, there was an adjustment <coughs> because of composition, and then inequality in market outcomes gradually and then increasingly increased. Government tax and transfer system was fairly effective in keeping inequality in disposable income relatively stable, and the same is true for consumption. Recall, though, I also showed you the growth trend in needs. Now, I'm not saying that the keeping inequality in disposable income in check through the tax and transfer system was purchased at the price of slowing growth. But it's very tempting, looking at the graphs, that there was some, some truth to that. And of course, that of course would require a full-fledged structural model to investigate whether that hypothesis was true or not. Or, if, as, as Mike said, could be trends that were going on independently of uh, the German reunification and dealing with it that, that were responsible, responsible for that. Now, upshot from the other countries, in quite a few other countries in Europe, you see exactly the same phenomenon. That market inequality is actually somewhat increasing, and substantially increasing towards the, the later part of the sample. <coughs> but disposable income inequality is surprisingly stable for other countries as well. In the US, government taxes and transfers did their share, but not all that, all that much to curb uh, market income inequality. But on some level, I mean, so, I don't know. Had I been betting going into this project what I would have thought I would find, I'm not so surprised about that. Not surprised about that. So let me say two words about this is consumption and wealth and blah blah. So let me briefly say two words about what happened in the German unification. So first of all, I mean it's sort of hard to not get theory I talking about the German just you know, unification because yeah. I mean, I grew up in a world where this was inconceivable. I mean, I was born in 1970. I, until 1988, when you were born there, you thought this was just not an event that ever will. It was just, all the people talked about unification, younger people thought this was just crazy. And then it happened, miraculously, and uh, I mean, whatever I say in terms of data should not overlay the fact that this was just a very lucky event happened in our lifetime. Nevertheless, I know I'm going to decompose the data and show you what, what happened to inequality uh, correlated to, to, that, to that event. And the nice thing about the variance of logs is they can easily be, the variance of logs can be nicely decomposed. So if you have variance of log of a variable, you can decompose it into three parts. Variance of log in the east times the number of people in the east. Variance of log in the west times the number of people in the West. So this measures inequality in the East. This measures inequality in the West, relative population share. And then there's a residual that basically measures inequality between the East and the West. And if you decompose the overall trend in inequality, roughly speaking, this is what you, this is what you, this is what you see. Uh, essentially, what you see is that in 1993, after the German unification, the East, in every variable you look at, 
was more equally distributed than the West. So this is inequality in the East. This is inequality in the West for wages, labor earnings, disposable income, and blah, blah, blah. And so, so the East was substantially more equal than the West. There was dispersion between the East and the West. You zoom forward 10 years later. The inequality between the East and the West has been reduced, more for some variables than for others. But if you look at the level of inequality between the East and the West, the level of inequality in the East and the West has converged, has converged as well. So there was some convergence in terms of levels of income and income per capita and the like. But at the same time, the East, which used to be much more equally distributed in terms of economic outcome, now is as unequally distributed as is the West. Now, I'm not saying any causality statements here, and I'm realizing that what used to be in the East is not any longer in the East because there was 1.5 million on that going from the East to the West. So I'm making statements about different sides of the population. I'm just saying that it's not any longer the case that living standards, economic variables and perhaps living standards in the East are more equally distributed than in the West. After 10 years, the difference in inequality has gone to nil. The difference in living standards has gotten closer, but far from being, it's far from being nil uh, at, the, at the moment. And that basically is basically all I, I want to say uh, about East, East Germany. Now, comparison to the rest of the world, that's hard to do because nobody else got reunited, as far as I know. So this is what we did. We documented the equality trends for Germany. Before German unification, not much happened. After German unification, not much for a while. Then an increase in market inequality, fairly tamed by the government tax and transfer system. Consumption inequality didn't budge. And there was convergence between the East and West in levels, but also in terms of inequality. In fact, and inequality even more so than, than in levels. The trends are fairly consistent relative to the rest of Western Europe and very different to the uh, Anglo-Saxon countries, where market inequality and disposable income inequality moved somewhat more lobster, and consumption inequality edged upwards as well, although not nearly as much as, as the income. The income. Well, I'm sure that 